Next, I want to talk a little bit about um, vectorization with OpenMP. So in OpenMP 4.0, there's a, a new feature called SIMD, which can help you to vectorize your code. And um, as we've heard from Tim in the morning, vectorization is an important feature, especially on the Xeon Phi, since it has very long vectors. But although the um, vectorization was mentioned over the week, I just briefly want to um, explain what it, what it actually means if uh, code is vectorized or running vectorized on your, on your machine. So the keyword here, and which is also used in OpenMP as keyword is SIMD, which means single instruction, multiple data, which means you have one instruction and you want to do the same thing uh, with several data items. So um, in this example here, let's say we have, a, we have a small for loop running from 0 to 3, and um, you just want to add vector B and C, store the result in A. And um, yeah, what, what would happen in a sequential execution of your program? You would have the first step taking element 0 of these two vectors, adding them, storing them in uh, element 0 of vector A. And in the next step, you take the next element. In the third step, you take element 2. In the fourth step, you take the last element. And you do all these steps one after the other. If you do vectorization, um, that needs special support from the hardware. What you basically do is, in step one, you load a vector of elements. In this case, it's a vector of length two. It's two double elements, zero and one. You load two elements of this vector, C, and you store them all together uh, in array A. So basically, in one step, you compute double the amount of data. You need special registers which have double the lengths, and you need special instructions to do the addition and, and the data movement. But basically, that's state of the art in, in nearly every hardware I'm, I'm aware of. And in step two, you take the next elements. And so as you can see, instead of four steps, you only need two steps. So this can speed up your application, in this case, by a factor of two. And um, yeah, so there are uh, different vector lengths around which, which you can use. For example, if you have SSE instructions, most of you will have heard that. And these are the... Oh, they are used for quite a while now. They have 128-bit um, registers, so they can load two double elements or four float elements in one register, compute two or four operations on them, and um, yeah, so you can speed up if you're working on doubles your your application by a factor of two if you only use vector registers and and instructions to c to compute on this. With Later processors like the Intel Sandy Bridge, Intel Ivy Bridge processors, um, the vector length was doubled. So now you can you have a 256-bit uh, register, so you can float, load four doubles or eight float in one uh, register and compute um, yeah, four or eight operations in one step. And on the Intel Xeon Phi, the um, extension is called AVX 512 now by Intel, was called differently before, so if you heard some other names, um, that's all, all the same for this mic architecture. And here you can load eight double elements or 16 float elements in one register and do eight or 16 computations at a time. So as you've heard from Tim already in the morning, this can really speed up your application. Of course, you can actually reduce the number of instructions which need to be executed in the best case, by a factor of 8 or 16 here. And um, of course, that, that's great if, if uh, you can do this. There's one thing you have to be aware of, this is uh, data alignment. That's a problem here. So you cannot do these operations on all addresses. So your data, your array A, has some starting point, And um, yeah, the computer has to map this to, to some address. And alignment means uh, that if you do a, a modular calculation, um, that uh, your address is a multiple of a certain number. So 
normally it's good if your data is aligned to a multiple of the lengths of a vector, because your vectors can start at address zero to load something, um, and then they load the first four elements in this case in, in one vector. If your data also starts at the same point, that's good. This can be loaded just four elements in once. If your data is not that good aligned, like here, so you start at address eight, you waste an element in this vector here, because you could have loaded one, one more element here. It's still not a, not a big problem, but if, you, if your data, for example, is just off by four in this case, so that's a rare case, but then you do not have an overlap with the vector, so that's really hard for the compiler needs to basically copy around all the data to do vectorization, and this kills all your speed up. So that's something you need to be aware of, and the compiler needs to be aware of. That's quite hard for the compiler in, in C, for example, if you have pointers to find out what's the alignment of a pointer at compile time. So you just have a function, you put in a double pointer, the compiler cannot know anything about the double area which is coming in. So it's hard to basically analyze your code automatically. Nevertheless, there are different approaches you can use basically to get your code vectorized. So the first and easiest one is you use auto vectorization by the compiler. Um, basically every compiler tries to analyze your loops and tries to vectorize them for you if you just uh, switch on an optimization level high enough. So the compiler tries to find out um, is it safe to vectorize this loop? So, or are there data dependencies which uh, basically forbid to execute simultaneous instructions? Of course, if, if the next instruction depends on the outputs of, of the first one, you need to first compute the first instruction, then the second one. So you cannot vectorize every loop. That does not work, only if there are no data dependencies between the, uh, between the used uh, data elements. So a compiler can in many cases find out a lot of things and vectorizes quite some loops, but yes, there are limits for a compiler. In this case, you can, for example, use OpenMP, what I will tell you in a, in a few minutes, the OpenMP SIMD uh, pragmas to tell the compiler, I know this loop can be vectorized. So if you have the knowledge, I will pass some array into this function which is aligned and all my arrays will not overlap, so it's safe to do this addition, for example, in uh, SIMD mode, you can tell the compiler, I am sure this loop can be vectorized, please do this for me. You can, can write uh, inline assembly code, okay, I forgot to put an example here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that basically is you can put instructions into your code where you say, I'm, I'm sure I want to have this assembly instructions executed here. And um, you can, for example, write this in, in a C loop. You just call then some function and say which inline assembly instructions you want to have executed. And if you for sure know these instructions will work, you, you can do this, but it's more work. So you get more and more explicit if you go down here. And the most explicit way to program, of course, is writing the assembler code yourself. Um, then you can just call the assembly instructions which, which do vectorization. But that is uh, really a lot of work, and it's it's yeah not that easy. But of course, if you, for example, you write a numerical library which is used by many people, like Intel writes their mass kernel library, they go down the path and really want to to get the last performance out of their machines. They really look at every instruction and write assembler code to get good performance here if it's necessary. So, but of course, you should start with the easy things. So let the compiler do what the compiler can do for you. If the compiler can figure out what can be vectorized, why should you do the work? Why should you think about it and add more stuff to your code, which you have to maintain? Um, so our default compiler used here is Intel compiler, but I think you can do this with, with nearly every compiler. You can ask the compiler for a report of what he has done. In this case, if you write vec report and a number, you can specify, I want to have output on what the compiler has vectorized for you. And there are different levels. So basically the default level is zero. So if you just compile your code, you never get output from the compiler what he vectorized or not. If you switch on this by setting uh, minus vec report equals, for example, one, you get some output which says um, this loop was vectorized, you get a line number. So if you have this, you know 
I do not need to look into this, so the compiler has figured out how to do this. And um, you can also get more verbose reports, so you can say which loops were vectorized, which were not. Well, then you know, okay, the, the non-vectorized loops I may have want to have a look at. Maybe I know they can be vectorized. Maybe I want to add a pragma here. You can also get a uh, report on, on why it has not been vectorized. So you get a report which says, well, I, I couldn't vectorize this loop course. I have a proven dependency between the data. I know this and this item overlap, and that's why I cannot vectorize this safely. Or the compiler says, I assume your errors may overlap here. Um, so I'm not sure whether it's safe to vectorize. I will not do that. You can read the output, and maybe you know better than the compiler because you have more um, understanding of your underlying data structures. You can tell the compiler with a prog mass, I will show you in a minute, um, that you should vectorize your code. And uh, yeah, it gets more and more verbose, so more information. Now, it doesn't get more and more verbose, so here you uh, only look at the non-vectorized loops, which may be interesting, or it, yeah, you get some estimation of what might the speed up be, which you can gain from vectorization in a loop and so on. So, but you get a lot of information by these reports. Typically, the most interesting things is which loops have not been vectorized and why. And if you know there's something different, then you can tell the compiler. Here is just one example. If you have a, say, a vec report equals three on, on an example code, we have our example collection. It might say, for example, the loop was not vectorized. It's not an inner loop. So um, if, it, if you have an outer loop and inside and, and another one, it will try to vectorize the inner loop, most loop normally and not the outer one, and this it gives you this information. Or it says there exist vector dependencies, so I've assumed flow dependency uh, between um, f and dx in these lines. And then um, here, you can check whether there are really dependencies. If it says it's assumed, it means it, it might be a dependency um, if, if your pointers overlap or so. So you might really, in, in this case, this is a loop you, you could vectorize safely, but the compiler cannot detect because um, C pointers are hard to interpret in this case. So if you really think you or you are sure your loop can be vectorized, now OpenMP provides a standard way to tell the compiler, please vectorize this loop. There have been several other approaches by, by yeah, many compilers where you could do it with some uh, special pragmas, special ways to tell the compiler I want this loop to be vectorized. Now it's standardized in OpenMP, so you have one way which should work with all compilers supporting OpenMP 4.0. I have to say at the moment there are not that many which support the vectorization, so I think only in Intel it's mostly implemented, but the standard is pretty new, so that I think this will change in the, in the near future. And the first pragma you need here is this SIMD pragma, which you can write in front of a for loop in C, and in Fortran you have uh, the SIMD pragma can write in front of a do loop, and you have an end SIMD pragma, um, which is optional at the end of the of the do loop. It's like like the parallel loops. If you don't write the pragma, it assumes the next uh, ending loop uh, statement will be the end of the SIMD loop. So you don't have to write this, and um, you can specify clauses here. And um, allowed clauses are the private, last private, the reduction clause, they basically do the same things than with the parallel pragma in OpenMP. They say I need a, a private version of this variable for every element in this vector, so everyone should work on, on a known temporary um, variable. Um, or reduction means at the end I want to have all these partial results which have been computed in the vector added up to one final value or there are other operations than adding them, but as with the parallel loop, you, you can do a reduction here. You can use a collapse clause if you know, well, I have two loops, one nested inside of the other, but I want to vectorize basically the complete um, iterations. You can collapse both loops, make one larger loop out of it, or the compiler does this automatically, and um, tries to vectorize this larger loop. You can specify that your data is aligned with a line clause if you know I always allocate my arrays uh, with, with memoline, and I know they are 256 byte aligned. I've allocated them in this way, and I always pass the beginning of the array to all my functions. Um, then you can say, okay, I know this is aligned. The compiler can take this information into account and, and generate better code. 
Um, in some cases, compiler is also uh, able to uh, create several versions and do a runtime check here, but if you know it, it's better to specify what, what you know. And linear means, I know I have a variable which changes in every iteration, but with a, with a linear step size. So for example, if you have something increasing always by one, you can specify this and then you get in the vector, for example, if you start at zero, you get zero, one, two, three in a vector of length four, which is then used in, in the iterations. And then there is one, one more clause, this is this safe len clause. To explain this, I have a, a short example again. So, of course, it's a, a little bit different than we see, we see PEL for pragma. So let's assume you have this loop here. You start from, from two to six, and now you have A of I here, and you use A of I minus two in this example. So you don't have independent iterations. If you basically do this serial, you have a, a dependency. This element needs to be computed if you start here. This element needs to be computed if you start here. So that could not be parallelized easily with, with an PEL uh, OpenMP loop. But for example, if you have 128-bit vectors, so you have two elements in one vector, you could just vectorize it. Of course, this is computed after the first step, and it's needed in the second step. But you don't have any overlap here. So it is, in this case, safe to, to vectorize two elements. If you would do this with four element vectors, so double the size of the vector, what you need here has not, not been computed at the beginning, so it is all only at the end of the statement available, so you cannot use it here. So that's uh, a problem. You cannot vectorize this with this vector length. So the vector length is important to see if a loop can be vectorized or not. And because of that, the safe length uh, clause allows you to tell the compiler it is safe to vectorize up to this length, and it's not safe to vectorize any further length. That's a little bit different than with the, with the parallel 4, where all iterations basically need to be independent, because you don't have a lot of uh, information how they are distributed, or if the number of threads changes, the distribution may change, and so on. And here you have a specific order. You know they start from the beginning and just go in, in larger steps. So this is a little bit different. Then there's also a, a combined construct. Um, where you can basically have a pragma OMP4 SIMD or pragma uh, OMP do SIMD, so not a pragma. Um, this means you have a loop and you want to have it parallelized with threads and you want to have it vectorized. And what this clause should basically give you is first um, the, the iterations are distributed across the threads. Um, according to whatever you specified for a schedule clause, so like it would be distributed if you only had the, the do or for uh, pragma. And then the remaining loops, which every thread has to execute, then are uh, yeah, executed with uh, SIMD instructions. And if you specify clauses here, um, basically the compiler will, in will interpret the clause for, for the individual pragma, so for the, for the for and for the SIMD loop if they apply. So if you write, for example, a reduction which would match for both, or private which would match for both, it would be um, interpreted for both constructs. If you have something like the safe language which is only valid for one, it would only be uh, interpreted on the SIMD construct. Okay, now if you want to vectorize something which, which has a function call, this is a problem. Yeah, so in this case, you have this instruction can be vectorized easily. This can be vectorized easily. But here you have a function call. And let's assume this, this cannot be executed in, in vector mode. This would mean, basically, you have to do this serially one after the other. And um, this really can become a bottleneck in execution. So function calls might cause problem. And the compiler, normally, if it cannot completely inline the function, gets problems to see what's going on here. So you have to take care of, of functions in your code, and OpenMP allows you to do so with this declare SIMD. So you, in the morning, I've heard from Christian about the um, declare target construct, which basically was used to tell I want to have functions compiled to be executed on a device. The SIMD construct says I want to have functions um, which can be executed in SIMD mode. So 
if I, for example, have a function which returns a double value and takes an integer value, and I, I write this OMP declare simdpragma in front of the definitions and declarations of the function, the compiler would generate a version of the function which uh, works serially as, as expected and would create a second version which would take a vector of ints and create a vector of doubles and executing everything inside in vector mode if possible. So um, this basically can create several functions. You can um, specify the length, which is simd length, the vector lengths you want to have in these functions. And you can also create different versions. You can have the same executable version of the functions, 128-bit vectors, 256-bit vectors, and so on, if you, if you know this, this is needed. And again, you can uh, use an aligned clause um, the linear clause to specify these arguments have a, have a linear step, as as we've seen with the uh, simd pragma. And then there's uh, something which is uh, called in branch or not in branch. Um, so this means the function can be co or is always or never called from within a conditional statement. Compiler can do some optimization. Um, so if you if you are in a conditional statement, sometimes not for all elements in the vector and. In, in, uh, um, operation needs to be performed, then you can um, basically mask this operation and, and give a mask where you say, okay, I want to have this only for, for the first and the third element, and then it's only executed there. But this can, can be more performance than doing this in sequential mode. But the compiler then needs to be aware of that there is also a mask uh, which says what needs to be executed and on which elements. And if this is not needed, if you know this is always executed on the complete vector, it can generate more efficient code. So you can tell the compiler if you know I'm always inside of a branch or I'm not here. Okay, now the example. So since Christian also used this pi example, I, I also took it here. Um, so I'm, I'm quite sure that Christian's example vectorized. Of course, I had some trouble to get the example not to vectorize automatically by the compiler. Of course, it's, it's very small, and for small loops um, where the compiler can see all the code, it does a pretty good job and, and vectorizes. But in this case, let's assume I have two separate files. I have this f function, which is called um, to basically evaluate the function here. Here, you, it is called for every iteration, and it's in a, in a separate file in my case. So in Christian's case, it wasn't the same file. The compiler can completely inline these uh, operations here and vectorizes automatically. Um, if it's in a separate file, the compiler cannot see it, and of course cannot automatically inline it without seeing it. So it needs to do the function call here, which basically prevents this loop from being vectorized automatically. Because the compiler says, well, you're calling a function. I don't know what's inside of this function. Anything can happen. It's not sure to vectorize. Um, and so to make this vectorize again, I first need to say, well, I need a vectorized version of this function. So in the f file where I have this function call, I need to say, well, I want to have a vectorized version of this function. And also, if I define it in the, in the pi file, I need to tell the compiler there will be a vectorized version of this function. So I need this pragma again. And then I can say, I'm, I'm sure this loop can be vectorized. I need a private version of this fx, as we had with the Perl threads as well. I need a reduction over f sum. It's the same as we've seen before. And um, I have a linear increase in this i. So basically, if this wouldn't be needed, the compiler would automatically figure it out from, from the structure of the loop. But in this case, you could also specify that, that it's, it's increasing linearly. And um, yeah, this basically would tell the compiler, I'm sure you can vectorize this code. And if you compile it, the, com the compiler really um, generates vector code here. And I just. Uh, ran some experiments on, on the cluster Linux tuning. This is a Westmere machine, um, which has SSE instructions, so 128-bit vectors. I could load or execute two doubles at a time, and uh, on the Intel Xeon Phi as well. So when I, when I did the test runs, it took uh, on the Westmere 1.44 seconds without the OpenMP pragmas. If I add the pragmas, it vectorized, and it was yeah, 0 0.72 seconds. So there's a speed up of two which I could get here. On the Xeon Phi, the serial version was much slower. And um, 
yeah, with the OpenMP pragma, it also vectorized. And the factor I got, also, actually, h should be the limit here. I get a factor of nearly 9. I have no idea why. So the compiler seems to do some more clever optimization in the vectorized case here than just using the same instructions with, with vector registers. But you can see on the Xeon Phi, there's really a, a lot of performance you can gain. But also another uh, interesting thing to observe, if you tune your code in this way, you say, I want to run on Xeon Phi, I do these optimizations, I really look in inside of my code, I write this pragma on all the loops where it fits and make the compiler vectorize it. And then at some point in time, you're in a system where no Xeon files exist, you still get a factor of two from your optimizations. So what you're doing here really also pays off on a host processor. And as I said, the, the modern Sandy Bridge processors would give you a factor of four here. Maybe in the next generations, Intel will on the host processor increase the, the vector length again, then you, you get another factor. And um, this is the advantage if you really tune your code. Also, you tune it to run on the Xeon Phi courses. Well, there was basically a hype to vectorize because you had these long vector registers. It also pays off on, on the host platform. So it's not wasted work, even if you don't have a Xeon Phi uh, at home or wherever you are working. So this is really an advantage, in my, in my opinion. Um, from this vectorization, it basically pays off on, on most common platforms. And if you've tuned your code to vectorize it, it pays also off on, on the host 